Hey guys, how's it going? Kriparian here. Today I want to bring you guys a video on how to play Magic the Gathering in real life. Yes, the outdoors. Wow, so scary. The reason I want to do that is because, well, that's how I played Magic. I played Magic, you know, when I was like, I don't know, eight years old, nine years old. It was like the most wonderful ever, most wonderful thing ever back then. And um, today we play Magic the Gathering Arena. We play Magic the Gathering Arena. And yes, I am sponsored by Magic the Gathering Arena, but no, this video is not sponsored. I am just making this because I think it would be a really cool thing for you guys to see. Those of you who are now checking out Magic the Gathering Arena, you can really see how the game originally was and you get to see how to play the game if you've never played the game before. There are some, I guess, compromises in how things work in Magic Gathering Arena versus IRL Magic, but they're all good. They all speed up everything. Uh, keeping track of life totals, keeping track of things, having the rules in play without having to like, judge, judge, I believe my opponent has absolutely no idea what he's doing, and well, uh, yeah, please overrule his ignorance. Yes, there is a lot of that when you play Magic in real life. So, uh, so much of that is streamlined in Magic Gathering Arena, but I think this core experience is one you can't miss. So in the background, I was opening a box, Magic Gathering gave me this box. They actually gave me like three boxes or something, just I don't know, maybe they love me or something. But uh, I thought I'd make a video out of it, open some of these packs, and then later on I make a few decks, just some real crap decks, and I explain the different mechanics in the game. And I do kind of a game against myself to give you guys the real basics, the real basics core of the game. If you do want to just jump into it, Magic Gathering Arena uh, does a pretty good job of teaching you the game, but learning the basics through IRL Magic is probably an experience that um, you just need to have. So today, I give you just that. So let's get into the highlights. All right, so these are the main cards in Magic the Gathering. There are some exceptions to these. There's a few more. There's like the Planeswalker, and uh, we'll not going to talk about that because, you know, you'll figure that out after you get the basis here. So these are the cards that uh, some of them we opened from the packs just now. In Magic the Gathering, the mana system is, well, it's called mana, but it's from lands. So these are lands. This is a plains, for example, and you utilize, you can play one land a turn and you can utilize the mana from each land. This is a plane, so it get this symbol, this is a white mana, you tap it and at the start of each turn your lands untap. So basically if you have one planes in play you're capable of utilizing one white mana each turn. That's the idea there. Some lands are non-basic, that was a basic planes. This is a non-basic land, this is Submerged Bone Yard. And this land, among with many others, is capable of producing more than just one type of mana. So this is capable of producing blue mana and black mana, islands and swamps. It can substitute for either one. As a consequence, it comes into play tapped, and some effects trigger on non-basic lands uh, to destroy them a bit more aggressively than basic ones. So that's also some of the disadvantages of using some of these more powerful, more flexible non-basic lands. So what do you do with these lands? Well, you can play stuff, this incredible foil chromium mythic rare somehow that we pulled. Uh, you can see the mana cost at the very top. So the very top we can see the mana cost requires us to have one white mana, one blue mana, one black mana, which is the requirement that uh, we can, we can not at the same time, but we can get from the lands we just showed, and four of any other type. So if you have like four red mana, you could do it that way. You need seven total mana to play this guy, and um, it has to have three of those specific kinds. Most decks in Magic the Gathering are going to be one, two, rarely three colors, so it is kind of like a pretty fixed card in the pretty fixed three color specific deck there. Now one thing that's very important is you can see maybe some of the text, yeah, every card has its own text and you'll figure that out as time passes. Uh, you can see as part of the text, um, this spell cannot be countered. So this spell cannot be countered, but this is this is a creature card, right? This is this is a creature, it's a, it's a dude, it's got stats. All the cards in Magic the Gathering, all of them, they're spells. 
So that's why this has an effect that it can't be countered. Every card is a spell, every artifact, every actual spell, instant, sorcery, everything is a spell, everything is a spell. And that's how people can use counter spell, they can counter certain spells, we'll talk about that in a second. This is a more basic creature card. This is the Mystic Archaeologist. It's a two cost, so you need one blue and one any other. So if you have the two previous lands, if you have the non-basic and the planes, the non-basic can produce blue and the planes can produce the colorless. So you could play this guy. And he has um, an ability there that you can see, uh, use five mana. So two blue and three colorless to draw two cards. That's the mystic archaeologist. So these type of abilities on cards, sometimes they're on enchantments, we'll talk about in a second. Sometimes they're on artifacts, we'll talk about that in a second. But these abilities on the cards themselves, uh, these can be used unless they say otherwise, whenever you want. You can use these on your opponent's turn. That's what makes it pretty interesting. So you can draw cards on your opponent's turn. The reason that's very valuable is you can play some spells on your opponent's turn as well. So your opponent might play as if you have specific spells and you know while he might be playing around those spells then you might not actually want to use those spells but then you have floating mana on his turn and you can utilize it to draw two cards at the very end perhaps instead. Next card is the artifact card. Let's go with the more basic version here. So this is a mana lith. So not only lands can produce mana, the mana lith is a pretty interesting card here. It's a three cost artifact and you can tap it just like you would a land. And you can add one mana of any color if you do that. It costs three to play. Artifact cards are generally a little bit less powerful than colored cards but the idea is that they're not colored cards so you can put this in any color deck if you wish because there's no specific mana type that you require to play this card artifacts just stay on the board they're just there they just do things and sometimes there are other types of artifacts so one type of artifact is the most common type other than just the artifact type itself is a creature. So this is the Gearsmith Guardian. So this is much like the creatures we just showed you guys, but it's not a colored creature, it's an artifact creature. It's in essence a colorless creature. But because it's an artifact creature, it falls prey to a few specific removal options that only target artifact cards and not non-artifact creatures, for example. So that's the idea there. This is kind of an ongoing effect. He, he has plus two attack as long as you control a blue creature. Then we have spells. Let's go with the more basic spells. So this is a sorcery spell. Okay, so this is a five cost spell and target creature gets plus three plus three until end of turn. All creatures able to block it this turn do so. So with sorcery spells, you can only play them when it's your main phase. It can be your pre-combat main phase or your post-combat main phase. So you can do this twice if you want but you can't do this in any other time. You can't do this at the uh, start of the turn, the very start of the turn. You can't do this at the very end step. You can't do this at the very end of the turn. And you cannot play this when it's your opponent's turn. It's a sorcery. It's like a slow spell. This is a slow spell. Sorceries are generally a little bit more powerful compared to the spells that can be played on your opponent's turn. And those are called instant spells. So this is an instant spell. This is Strangling Spores, costs four, instant. You can see it right there. Target creature gets minus three, minus three until end of turn. And with these spells, I can kind of explain the stack a little bit. So let's say, for example, that I have a Mystic Archaeologist in play and he is ready to attack and I want to buff him up. So I'm going to play Declare dominance on him. I want him to get plus three, plus three in stats, and all creatures able to block this turn do so. We'll talk about the blocking mechanism in a moment. So I, it's my turn, that's why I can play the sorcery. So I go, okay, I wanna play this on this card. Now, in doing this action, the I want to play this on that card, my opponent has a window where he can respond to this. So let's say he was holding the strangling spores in his hand, which gives the target creature minus three, minus three. He can cast this from his hand while it's my turn on the same creature that I wish to buff. 
And why would you want to do that? Well, sometimes you just want to do that to lower its stats. But in this specific case, what he's accomplishing is he's able to kill the creature before his spell buffs it. When someone responds to something, it goes on top of the stack. This is kind of like the spell and instance stack, okay? So if I do something and then something gets added to the stack, it gets added on top and it resolves first. So basically what happens is Mystic Archaeologist has a bunch of crap heading his way. And the first thing is Strangling Spores. Strangling Spores gets applied to Mystic Archaeologist, reducing his stats by minus three, minus three, and it kills it. The next thing on the stack is declared dominance, but he's dead, so that doesn't happen. It does no longer have a legal target to finish casting this spell. So the reason instants uh, are so powerful because of their instantaneous playability is because they can themselves counter cards and in essence give you very good tempo and value. Think about it this way. If this card is played, it's a two cost, two one, and I just kill it for four, you know? It's not a very good play because I'm using four mana to deal with two mana, and it's one card for one card. So it's pretty whatever, right? Now, if I have the Mystic Archaeologist and I'm trying to play the Declared Dominance, so I'm using a second card and I'm using seven total mana, and in response to Declared Dominance, my opponent kills it with Strangling Spores, getting a two for one and mana advantage trade, well, that's a whole different story and that's only possible because it's an instant type spell, which is very powerful. Those, you, you're gonna need some of those in your decks. The other kind of card I wanna talk about today is the enchantment card. Enchantment card is much like an artifact card, except it's not an artifact card, it's an enchantment card. It just stays in play, it usually costs, I think it always costs colored mana, so this is a green enchantment card, and it just does what it says in the text box. So at the beginning of your upkeep, this is the beginning of your turn basically, if you control a creature with four or greater power, you draw a card. So if you have a big dude, you draw a card in addition to the card that you normally draw on your turn. That's the idea with that. And some enchantments have additional uh, uses. For instance, this is an enchantment aura. So this enchantment, instead of just being on the playing field, it is a, in essence applied to a creature. So this gives enchant creature, so you play this on a creature, minus six attack, and when it blocks, it gets destroyed. Yeah, so that's basically the idea there. Now, I've built a few of these decks for you guys to understand here, uh, kind of how the, the flow of gameplay works. The legal deck is 60 cards. You play for 40 cards when you do sealed or draft, so it's a little lower requirement. These are much less than that. I just want to do this to illustrate how the turn conditions and how all of that kind of stuff works out. This is a green-blue deck, and in general, uh, you're going to be looking at building one to two, rarely three or more color decks. So that's kind of the idea there. This deck has a few artifacts as you saw there with the Manolith, another Manolith, and we have a few elves here that can basically ramp up the mana generation and allow us to cast bigger things. So it's a stall the early game, kind of, and cast bigger things in the late game deck. That's the theme of that. And we're going to pin it against the deck that just tries to kill the opponent right away. So it's gonna have some red cards, some cards that can deal damage very quickly, very easily for efficient cost shocks, very nice. And some of the powerful early game uh, creatures are white. So we have some white in there, white, red. So this deck aims to kill the opponent relatively quickly. But again, these are very makeshift decks. So let's clean that up. So let's just try to um, shuffle these relatively well here. Let's get let's get those in there because you know we have to shuffle. It has there is a random element to every card game that we play. In essence, let me put those in there. Uh, terrible shuffling technique. Whatever. Just get them a bit mixed up. Okay. So this will be let's just say the opponent's deck because we're going to be honest players and play control. We're going to be playing the um, the green blue deck and we're going to try to out control our opponent i have very good reason to believe we will because i think the aggressive deck kind of sucks all right cool so when a game of magic starts you 
flip a coin, see who goes first or second in real life magic. Um, and the player who goes first gets to see their hand first. You first um, draw seven cards from your deck. So let's draw seven cards. We'll draw one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And in your opening hand, you're looking for a hand where you can actually play some of the cards that you have. So how many lands do we have? We can take a look at the lands. We have two lands and we have the Manalith, which will ramp us up a little bit. So if we get a third land, we're gonna be sitting real pretty, but even if we don't, we are able to play this. Um, and well, that's about it, but the decks are small, so whatever. You basically gauge if you can play the hand. If you cannot, you send back your hand into your deck and you draw another six cards. So let's see, let's just say that we keep this hand. So the player going first keeps, they're going second, takes a look at first seven cards. Um, there's a plains, there's a mountain. It's pretty playable, so why don't we just keep that as well? The player who goes first does not draw an additional card. So the player who goes first just gets to play. So we don't have any, oh, we do have a card that costs one mana, but it costs a blue mana, and the only source of blue mana comes to play tapped. So let's just play one land a turn. Remember, one land can be played a turn. So we go um, on tap, upkeep, draw, but we don't get the draw because we're going first. So we're, we're on the play. So main phase number one, we play a land and then we have the combat phase, but there's no, there's no creatures in play. So there basically is no combat phase. Then we go to the second main phase. Then we go to the end phase and my opponent has no land. So there's basically no, no end phase to really talk about there. Now it's the second player's turn and the second player's turn it's on tap upkeep. He does draw, he's on the draw because he's going second and he's playing an aggressive deck so he's gonna to wanna to play as much stuff as possible as fast as possible. The options are to play a novice knight which has defender or can't attack. It can attack if it's enchanted or equipped but it's not that right now and we don't have any enchantments in hand right now. I'm actually not even sure I put one in the deck. The other card we have is the goblin motivator and uh, he can tap to give haste to a, uh, a creature, so that might be pretty useful. So let's play the mountain. It goes into play untapped because that's how lands go into play. One land a turn, we'll play the planes on the following turn. And we can tap the land, so now we have one red mana in our first main phase, and we can play the goblin motivator. So let's, let's just have that guy kind of on the board over here. Space might be a little bit of an issue. So um, now we can't really do anything. Uh, it can't give haste to itself because uh, it has summoning sickness. So it can't attack. No creature can attack the first turn that it's played and no creature can use its tapping abilities. So you can't do the tapping ability on the card its first turn. If it's an ability that doesn't cause it to tap, it can use that whenever, whenever it wants, even immediately once it's played. So the turn is basically over for this player. So it's our turn here. Let's see what we draw. Draw a card, we drew a forest. So on tap first and then upkeep and then draw, but whatever, it doesn't, doesn't really matter too much. So we can play a forest. So we have uh, a land that can produce a forest or an island, and we have a forest. So we can play the uh, Gearsmith prod uh, Prodigy if we have an artifact against one attack. So we don't have an artifact, but we can tap one blue land with the non-basic there and play our Prodigy. There's the combat phase now but um, we're not able to attack because of summoning sickness. So then it's my opponent's turn. Uh, on tap, upkeep, draw. We have a Cavalry Drill Master. When Cavalry Drill Master enters the battlefield, target creature gets plus two and gains first strike until end of turn. So how about that? So that's, that's an interesting two drop. So we play a land for the turn. We can play either the Vashino Pyromancer Nothing else costs two. We can play the knight. Don't really want to play the knight. Let's play the cavalry drill master. So we can tap one white and one red, satisfying the colorless requirement. We play that. When it comes into the battlefield, uh, target creature gets plus two attack and first strike until end of turn. And I think what we're going to do is we're going to target itself. So itself is going to be a 4-1 first strike. First strike does damage before taking damage. And then we're going to tap this to give target creature haste. So this has haste, no longer has summoning sickness, it can attack this turn, and it's a 4-1 first strike. 
So after this main phase, we go to the combat phase. Combat in Magic the Gathering is very interesting. Um, the player who attacks just attacks, and you attack by tapping the creature you want to attack. So he chooses to attack with this creature. He chooses to attack with the Cavalry Drill Master. It's temporarily a 4-1. It also has first strike. So the attacker just attacks. Each player starts the game with 20 life. You can go over 20 life by gaining life, and when your life hits zero, you instantly lose. The player who's being attacked can choose whether or not he wants to block and how he wants to block. So now he attacks. It's on basically us, the control player, the green blue player. Do we want to take four damage or do we want to block with the Gearsmith Prodigy and have him essentially die? When bigger minions come into play, the health will actually regenerate at this at the uh, I think it's end of each turn or start of each, I don't know whatever the health regenerates every turn. So if he would have attacked the one one, I could block it with the one two. His one one would die. My one two would essentially be fully healed uh, when the turn would roll over. But right now we have a four one first strike. If I block that, it dies. There's no rollover damage, so a blocked creature just deals damage to the creature that it that was blocking, not to the player. But I think in this case we're just gonna take the damage. So we're gonna take four damage. Players in real life magic sometimes get those 20 sided dice. So I'd move that from 20 to 16 because now, now I'm at 16 health. So he's tapped out, he has no lands untapped, he has no creatures untapped. It's pretty clearly my turn. There's no need for a second main phase. Turn starts, untap, upkeep, nothing we wanna do. Let's draw a card for our turn. We drew the Fountain of Renewal. At the beginning of your upkeep, you gain one life. How about that? So what we're going to do is we're going to play the land for the turn, one land to turn. We're going to tap three mana. And we're going to play the Manalith, which is an artifact, but it's essentially a land. And artifacts actually can be tapped unless they're creatures. So um, the summoning sickness only applies to creatures. So add one mana of any color. So we can play that for three, and then we tap it. So we have one mana of any color. And we are going to play the Fountain of Renewal. So at the beginning of your upkeep, you gain one life. If we choose to attack, we can deal one damage to the opponent, but why would we want to do that when we can hopefully, or two damage, because now we actually have an artifact, two artifacts in play. So if we attack, we can't block. A tapped creature is not capable of blocking. So if, if the Gearsmith Prodigy would attack, he would guarantee damage to the opponent's face and get him from 20 to 18. But in attacking, I'm surrendering its ability to block on my opponent's combat phase. So I don't think we want to do that. The strategy of this deck is to kind of um, roll it out, wait for it, and well, uh, see what the big turns do. Untap phase for the opponent. Draw a card. We have a land. Uh, and that does save us a little bit because there's not too many playable cards otherwise, but it comes into the battlefield tapped. So comes into the battlefield tapped, it can produce either color. So right now we have two mana available. Uh, this is a 2-2 two -two because there's an artifact, there's a 2-1, it no longer is buffed, that was a one turn buff, and the goblin can tap to give haste to something. So I think what we're going to do is try to do more damage to the opponent. So we're going to play the Vaishina Pyromancer for one colorless and one red. We're going to give haste to the Vaishina Pyromancer so he no longer has summoning sickness. And we're going to attack with both of these creatures because, well, it's playing a face deck. We want to we want to kill the opponent as fast as possible. So now it's on this player to block. There's four damage being threatened, but I do have a blocker this time. I have a two-two. So if I choose to block either of those, it would trade. Both both of them would die. I don't see myself attacking with this in the long term, so I think blocking is a sound strategy. So I will actually block the Vaishina Pyromancer instead of the Cavalry because the Vaishina Pyromancer has an ongoing ability. So, uh, oh, no, he does two damage to a player when he enters the battlefield. Never mind, it's not an ongoing ability. So I'm actually at 14 health. Okay, whatever, it doesn't matter which one I block. So fine, I'll just block the Pyromancer. Uh, these guys will kill each other and these guys will enter the graveyards. So those guys are both dead. And the two damage from this is taken. So I'm at 12 now. Turn ends, nothing left to play. Um, things on tap. And upkeep. 
So I do gain one, one life. I'm going to go from 12 to 13. We drew an Essence Shatter to counter a creature spell. That's pretty interesting. We do have four mana right now, and we're capable of playing the Sky Rider Patrol. So it costs one green, one blue, and two colorless. We easily have that in our three lands and one mana lith, so we can play the Sky Rider Patrol, and things will get interesting from here on out. Summoning Sickness, everything's tapped. Time to pass. Opponent's turn, draws a card. We have a Gutter Snipe. Whenever you play an instant or sorcery your spell, deals two damage to each opponent. I thought that was the card I was playing a little bit earlier. We do have three lands this turn, though, however. Um, whenever another creature with two power less enters the battle under your control, pay one to draw a card. Hmm, it's rather weak. All of these are actually rather weak, and I'll tell you why. I think we're just going to play the Gutter Snipe regardless. But here's where things get a little bit tricky. There's a 2-1 there, there's a 2-2-2 two, 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 two there that can be given haste from the Goblin Motivator, but the opponent has a 2-3 Flyer ready to block. Now, if a two, if the 2-3 Flyer takes 2 damage but doesn't die, and then it goes to the next player's turn, it'll once again become a 2-3 creature. So, it essentially heals. Everything heals if it doesn't die when the turn rolls over. So, that can be pretty devastating in this situation, because if if I want to give the Gutter Snipe uh, haste and attack with both of them. I'm pushing for two damage, but I'm losing one of the creatures. I don't think that's a good idea. So in this case, I don't think there will be any attacking from the aggro player. And this is probably why I mentioned that the aggro player will probably lose this match. Untap everything, upkeep, we, draw, we, we gain an extra uh, life. So we're at 14 now at the beginning of combat. So that's that's not right now. So we can we can maybe check that. So let's see, draw a card, play a land. We have, how much do we have here? We have five mana. So we are capable of playing Essence Shatter or waiting with an Essence Shatter, or we can play the Bristling Boar. Or there's an ability here. At the beginning of combat on your turn, you may pay one green, one blue. When you do, put a one-one counter on another creature you control. That creature gains flying until end of turn. Now, we don't have another creature yet, um, but we can play one. Let's tap four. Let's play the boar. And, well, if we attack, it flies. Flying things can only be blocked by other flying things. The opponent has no flyers. So I have a blocker now. He didn't attack last turn. Why don't we just attack with the Sky Rider Patrol? We can finally do some damage, getting him to 18. As this game rolls out, you can use your imagination. The aggro player will try to swarm the board with large number of creatures. It might try to take advantage of the whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell deals two damage to each opponent, but that might be very difficult because the control player has a perpetual life gaining tool with the Fountain of Renewal. The control player will start playing larger and larger creatures, and it can be very difficult to actually um, uh, keep up because the aggro player didn't do enough in the early game. There's another mechanic I want to highlight, so actually, why don't we do another turn here? So let's untap, upkeep, nothing to do, draw. We have a falcon, and we're still on three mana, which actually puts us in a fairly weak position, but um, sure. Um, let's play the falcon. The falcon flies. The opponent does have a flyer, but it's tapped. We can give the falcon uh, haste, so the falcon can attack pushing for one damage, and well, it at least did something. All right, now it's this player's turn. Untap, upkeep, gain one life, so we're back up to 14. Draw, we got a land. Uh, we can play the Horizon Scholar here, which is pretty sick, um, but we can do that after anyway. Anyway, so here in the attack phase, I can attack with both of these creatures, and my opponent who dictates how uh, he wants to block, he can choose to block with two creatures to one. In fact, the boar, I believe, requires it. Can't be blocked. But, oh, you can't do that. Can't be blocked with more than one creature. Okay, so if he didn't have that ability, and I attack, if he didn't have that ability, he could be double blocked. So this is there's a defensive advantage to having um, more smaller creatures, but when it comes to attacking with like you know the big guys, the bigger guys typically win. So that's the idea there. If I attack and it could be double blocked, you know those three would go down that way. So that's how that's how Magic the Gathering works. And uh, well, there's a lot of other videos to see 
how it works in Magic the Gathering Arena, and I hope you guys have learned quite a bit in this video.